Dear brothers and sisters, I want to welcome you to attend our online service. Let us always be faithful and continue to trust in Him. Jesus warned us that as His return draws nearer and nearer, there will be increase in wickedness and the hearts of many will grow cold. One way we can avoid falling, falling into spiritual lethargy is to meet regularly with believers. Stay connected with some believers where you can meet for services, Bible study, or to pray together. God has given us the church where we can receive love and spiritual care. God's love is in the church. He has given believers spiritual gifts. If you need His help, go to church. The help is there. I will lead us to say the opening prayer. Let's pray. Father, how lovely is thy dwelling place. O oh Lord, our hearts long for your courts. Indeed, we want to say like the psalmist, a day in your court is better than a thousand days elsewhere. Lord, you are our sun and our shield. Your favor and mercy are what we need. There's nothing we desire more than your love and presence. Lord, we worship you. To you belong all glory, honor, and power. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We will sing two songs to worship the Lord. Make sure we sing wholeheartedly, for we are asked to love the Lord with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Give thanks to the Lord, our God, our King. His love and just forever. For He is good and He's above all things. His love and just forever. Sing praise, sing praise with a mighty hand, with a mighty hand and a fresh heart. Love and just forever All the lies that's been reborn Is love and just forever Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise From the rising to the setting sun, His love and just forever. Forever
deserve all our praise and all the glory. Good morning. Good morning. It's a joy to come to this church to worship with you all and also to share the word of God. It's a privilege to do that. Today my sermon is Romans 15, verse 1 to 13. It's pleasing others. I'm titled the sermon as pleasing others. We will read the passage, Romans chapter 15, verse 1 to 13 together. Let's be together. We who are strong ought to bear with the feelings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed, and moreover that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing the praises of your name. Again, it says, Rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will spring up, one who will rise to rule over the nations. In him, the Gentiles will hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word. As we ponder upon your word, open our hearts and open our minds to hear your voice. In Jesus' name, Amen. There was a story. There was a story about a Japanese tourist. He was staying at Pullman Hotel. And he wanted to go to the airport. So he hired a taxi. The taxi was a Hoton Vira. On the way to the airport, a car zoomed past them. And the tourists responded, Oh, look, 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 it's the Toyota. Toyota, made in Japan. Very fast. Very fast. <laughs> then not too long after, another car, another car flew past the taxi. The Japanese exclaimed, Oh, look, look, it's a Nissan. Nissan made in Japan. Very fast. Very fast. When the taxi was uh, almost arrived, the taxi almost arrived at the airport. Another car overtook the taxi. The tourist shouted, Look, look, it's a Mitsubishi made in Japan. Very fast. The taxi driver was a little irritated. He was irritated that the Japanese cars are overtaking his Proton Vira. When the taxi arrived at the airport, the taxi driver pointed at his meter, the meter, and said, 200 ringgit. Huh? 200 ringgit? So much! Why so much? Ask the Japanese. So much 200 ringgit! The taxi driver said, uh, This meter, this meter, made in Japan very fast! <laughs> One thing the story tells us is this, that the strong should not look down on the weak. The fast one should not look down on the slow one. And another thing it tells us, it tells us that our strength our strength can be our weakness. Very fast can be an advantage or it can be a disadvantage. Paul has something to say to the strong among us. Let's look at 
Romans 13, 1 to 2. Verses 1 to 2. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. Here, Paul mentions two kinds of Christians. What are the two kinds? The strong and the weak. Way back in Romans 14, Romans chapter 14, the, the previous chapter, Paul has been talking about the weaker brother. The weaker brother is legalistic. He lives according to inflexible rules. He lives according to rules. He lives by rules. Everything is either black or white. No in between. Eating vegetable, eating vegetable is wrong. I'm sorry. Eating vegetable is right. Eating meat is wrong. Paul draws a contrast between, between these two kinds of believers, the strong and the weak. Who is the strong believer? Who is the strong believer? The strong believer is a mature believer. He understands his liberty in Christ. He knows what it means to be free in Christ. He knows the essentials and the non-essentials of the Christian faith. What is important, what is not important. In contrast, the weak believer has not reached the level of maturity. He does not know how to enjoy the freedom in Christ. He does not know about his liberty in Christ. He cannot tell the difference. He cannot differentiate between the essentials and the non-essentials of the Christian faith. Every one of us, every one of us here has to go through these different stages of maturity. We were all once weak believers. We were immature Christians. Not mature. We were baby Christians. None of us become mature in our faith instantly. We take time to grow in our faith. We mature in our faith as we grow in our relationship with the Lord Jesus. And this takes time. And because it takes time to grow our faith, there will always be weak Christians and strong Christians in our congregation. So in Romans 13 verse 1, Apostle Paul tells a stronger brother what to do. That he ought to bear with the feelings of the weak. The word ought signifies an obligation. It tells us that we have a duty to our brothers, duty to our sisters in Christ. What is this duty? What is this obligation? Verse 1, Paul tells us that we are to bear the feelings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let me explain the word bear. The word bear doesn't just mean to put up with somebody. You know, just like tolerating someone's idiosyncrasies. Uh, a Christian brother has a funny habit. Uh, just bear with it. Uh. You have no choice but to put it up, uh, put up with it, uh, put up with it. No. It's more than putting up with somebody. It's actively taking up the responsibility to help a person carry his burden. We are to offer help. We are to offer assistance to a weaker brother, not just to tolerate his funny behavior. After telling us to bear the feelings of the weak, Paul proceeds to tell us not to please ourselves. One of the problems of our day is that people are so self-centered, so absorbed with themselves that they cannot see, they cannot see the need of others. We are so engrossed in our own personal needs and desires. We are so caught up in our self-image, self-impression, self-love, self-esteem. Caught up in so many things that revolve around ourselves. No wonder we become so inward looking. No one has to teach us to be selfish. Selfishness is natural. Self-preservation is natural. Self-interest is natural. But, but Paul tells us to move out of self-interest and look 
into the interest of others. Instead of pleasing ourselves, we should seek to please our neighbor. Paul's command us, Paul's command us to please others. This may seem contradicting. This may seem to contradict his other statements in Galatians 1:10. Galatians 1:10 says, "Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God, or am I trying to please people?" If I was still trying, if I was still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Then again, in 1 Thessalonians 2:4, it says, "On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts." How do we resolve this problem? How do we resolve resolve this tension? On one hand, Paul commands us to please men. On the other hand, he himself forbids himself. He didn't allow himself. He forbids himself from pleasing men. When is it right to please men, and when is it wrong to please men? The answer to the problem is this. The answer to this problem is this. We must first look at the option. When we must choose between pleasing. Others or pleasing ourselves, we should choose to please others rather than ourselves. But when the choice is between pleasing others and pleasing God, we should choose to please God rather than man. In our passage here, Paul instructs us to please others and not ourselves. Notice carefully. Paul is not saying that we should try to please everybody. Ah,、uh. he's not saying that. He's not saying you to please everybody. It is impossible to please everybody. We should not compromise, compromise our standards just to make somebody happy. Paul does not say we should please everyone at all costs. That is dangerous, and that's wrong. Notice that Paul's command to please our neighbor is qualified by the phrase "for their good," and the purpose of this pleasing is to build them up in the Christian faith. The words are underlined on the screen. Paul is saying that we are to live the kind of life that build others up in the Lord. The way we live has the power either to build others up. Or to tear others down. Ultimately, every Christian is in the construction business or in the demolition business. Paul wants all of us to be in the construction business. We should help others to grow in the Lord. If that means giving up a few rights along the way, so be it. If that means I have to deny myself. Along the way, so be it. If it helps my brother or sister to grow stronger in the Lord, then I will live my life to please Him or to please her. We live lives that build others up, not to tear people down. If you ask Paul, can you give me an example of someone who has lived his life to please others for their good? Paul will say, Yes, Romans. Fifteen verse three. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insult of those who insult you have fallen on me. Paul is saying, "You want an example? Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Jesus is our supreme example of a person who lived his life for the good of others." Here, Paul quotes an Old Testament verse. The verse is actually taken from Psalms sixty-nine, verse nine. The insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. The insults people make against God fell upon Jesus, and as God's son, Jesus endured them. He did not fight back. Jesus lived to please God and also lived for the good of others. Think of all that Jesus went through. 
to provide salvation for us. Think of all that Jesus went through for our interest. He left heaven. You sang the song just now. He left heaven, came down to earth as a man. He suffered poverty. He became poor for us, for our sake. He was hated and rejected by those who came. He came to save. Even his own family refused to believe in him. Ultimately, he was nailed to the cross, and there he died for people who hated him. He died so that we may live. Paul has given us an example in Christ. Next, he gives us the encouragement through the Bible. In verse four, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Notice the word scriptures here. What is taught in the past? The word scriptures here, and including that means is what written in the past. The scriptures here refers to the Old Testament. When we read words like this, ah, we think that it refers to the whole Bible, including the New Testament. No, no, no. This part, when you talk about scriptures, it means the Old Testament. As to live out our lives to please others, as we serve others for their well-being, as we serve the Lord this way, there will come there will come times of discouragement and defeat. The Old Testament can help us to overcome this discouragement. And defeat. The Old Testament is a source of endurance and encouragement in our lives. What is the endurance? What is the endurance taught in the Old Testament? What is it? What is it all about? It is the endurance of godly men and godly women who stood fast, who did not waver in the midst of persecution. You can find the list of godly men and godly women in Hebrews chapter eleven. The heroes, they are the heroes of our faith. The example of other believers who have endured and remained faithful is a great stimulus to our own perseverance. The Old Testament can teach us endurance. The Old Testament can also give us encouragement. How comforting and how encouraging it is to know that God never fails to fulfill His promises. And he remains committed to his people, even when they are not as committed to him as they should be. We often stumble, we often fail, we persist in sinning, we fail to love others as we should, we put too high a priority on our own pleasure and comfort. God is not pleased with our failures. He's not pleased, but. Is willing to forgive, and he never turns his back on his own children. Isn't this comforting? Isn't this encouraging? And now we not only have the Old Testament, we also have the New Testament. Now we are Christian. Now we are the, after the. This is after the New Testament has been written. So when Paul was talking. Was right. I wrote this letter, Romans chapter fifteen. The New Testament was not completed yet. No, not, not completed. Yet. So he was referring referring to the Old Testament. But now we also have the New Testament. So we have more records of how God deal with His people. More teachings on endurance. More teachings on encouragement. The Bible, the whole Bible, can strengthen us. The Bible can encourage and can encourage us. As we go through difficult times, and through the encouragement of the Bible, we can have hope. We can have hope, so we can be optimistic about the future. The you know, Christians are the opti are most optimistic. They are optimistic people, you know. Christians are optimistic people. We are not pessimistic people because we have hope. We have hope for the future, even in the midst of discouragement and problems, even in the midst of financial crisis. The Wuhan crisis, the Wuhan virus epidemic, we can still have hope. I will talk more about hope later on. Paul continues with verses five to seven. 
It says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had. So that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Verse 5, verse 5 is a prayer Paul prays for the church in Rome. The same God who strengthens you with endurance and encouragement through the Bible also wants to give you a spirit of unity. Now, unity does not mean agreeing, agreeing about everything. Paul has written chapter 40, Romans chapter 40, the previous chapter, to tell us that it's okay to have differences, to have differences of opinion on disputable, disputable matters. In the context of the Church of Rome, this means the Jewish Christians are free to observe the dietary laws. Eat, they are free to eat kosher food, halal food. They are free to observe the Sabbath. Whereas the non-Jewish Christians are free, are free to eat whatever they want. They can eat a stew pot, they can eat chashu rice, they can eat gofanki bakute. And they don't need to observe the Sabbath. So non-Jewish Christians don't have to do all that. Don't have to do what the Jewish Christians do. For us today, it means respecting each other's opinions in areas like drinking alcohol, investing in stocks and shares, women's leadership in the church, and playing mahjong. In all these areas, Bible-believing Christians have different convictions. If unity does not mean full agreement in everything, then what does it mean? What does unity mean? Unity means, based on these verse, verses, unity means glorifying God with one mind and one voice, even though we have different opinions on certain matters. We may hold different convictions. We may have we may hold different different commissions. But our minds and our voices can be united to glorify God. That's what we are doing every Sunday. Our mind, our mind refers to our internal state. You cannot see our mind. You cannot see my mind, you know? It's internal. Internal state. Oh, thank you. Our voice refers to our outer state. You may not see, but you can hear. It's auto state. What we say with our words. Unity has much to do with our mind and our voice. Our mind must have the right attitude to accept each other. Our voice, in turn, must affirm this relationship. We say with our mouth, I accept you as my brother in Christ. I accept you as my sister in Christ. Why don't you say one to one another? I accept you. Yeah, say it to your daughter. Yeah, say it to one another. You can say to your wife. Yeah. <laughs> I accept you as my brother in Christ. I accept you as my sister in Christ. <laughs> you are practicing? What's seven actually? What's seven practicing? The kind of unity that honors God. It's both internal, mind, and external, the voice. Internal, the mind. External, the voice. So we come now to verse 8 to 13. Verses 8 to 13. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises, promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed. And moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy. And it is written, Therefore I will praise you. As it is written means written in the Old Testament. Therefore I praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing the praises of your name. And again, it says, Rejoice you Gentiles with His people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples extol Him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will spring up, one who will rise to rule over the nation. In him, the Gentiles will hope. 
May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I would like to deal with verse 13 first. Verse 13 is a closing prayer of Paul for this section. Verse 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with, with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In this prayer, Paul uses three important words which are underlined. What are they? Joy, peace, hope. These three important things, these three things, joy, peace, and hope, are what all men are seeking after. If we are honest, we will have to say that we spend our entire lives looking for these three things. Men have exhausted fortune and spent countless years seeking after these things. But these things, joy, peace, and hope, cannot be bought. They can only be found in Jesus. He is the source of our joy, He is the source of our peace, and He is the source of our hope. And these things will become the personal possessions of every person who puts his trust in Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, you have joy, you have peace, and you have hope. And let's take a few minutes to examine each of these words this morning. The first word, joy. When we think of joy, we immediately think of happiness. But real joy is more than that. Happiness is affected by circumstances. When the situations of life, when the situations of life please us, we are happy. When there are problems, when we face problems, we become unhappy, unhappy. No. Real joy cannot be touched by circumstances of life. Real joy is a sovereign gift of God. It is part of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. You and I will not always be happy as we go through life. But we can always have joy. Joy in the Lord. Our circumstances change, but our Lord never changes. Our Lord does not change. That's why we can always have joy in the Lord. Do you have joy? Do you have this joy in your heart this morning? The second word, peace. The Christian life is characterized by peace. The word peace means to join together. Join together. It is the exact opposite of the word worry, which means pull apart. Peace, join together. Worry, pull apart. The life that is filled with God's peace is a life not pulled apart by worry. It is a life that experiences, experiences true peace of heart. It knows that whatever happens in life, it is, it is all in the hand of the Lord. No matter what happens, God will take care of all matters, including all the small details in your life. Jesus promised to give us this kind of peace. We can experience this peace in every situation. Do you have this peace this morning? Regardless, regardless of what's happening in your life, do you know that the Lord is in control and that He will take care of you? That is the peace of the Christian life. No matter what happens, I know my Lord is in control. Then you can peace. The third word is hope. This hope is not, it's not wishful thinking. I hope it will not rain tomorrow as it's raining every, almost every day. I hope it will not rain tomorrow. It may still rain tomorrow even if you have hope. It's the kind of hope that you, you hope that it will not rain. Even though you hope that it will not rain, it may still rain. We are not talking about this kind of hope. The Christian hope is a deep conviction. It's a deep assurance, a deep belief based on a clear word from God. The Christian rests on the promises of God. When we make promises to our friends, we may not, we may fail to keep our promises, you know. 
But not God. Whatever He promises, He will fulfill. He will keep His promises to His people. These promises give us hope. What are these promises? They are described in verses 8 to 12. You can refer to your Bible or you want me to go back. Here, verses 8 to verses 12. I think better refer to the Bible easier because I got two slides here, 8 and 12. These are all the promises. Let's see this verse 8. You see the promise there? Oh, verse 8, let's see. Yeah. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed. In the past, God promised Abraham. God said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God speaking to Abraham. This promise was passed on from generation to generation in Israel. Finally, the time came when Jesus was born to fulfill this promise. When Jesus came to earth 2,000 years ago, most people in Israel thought God's promises were exclusively for Israel exclusively for Israel, to make Israel great again. The Jews thought that these promises were for them only, not for Gentiles like you and me. Huh? So they were wrong, the Jews were wrong. God's plan and promise was for the benefit of all the families of the earth, not just the Jewish family. In verses 8 to 12, Paul quotes a few Old Testament verses to show that the Gentiles are included in God's promises. I'd like to ask you, how many books are there in the Old Testament? How many books? 39. 39. And the 39 books are divided into three sections. We call them the Law, the Prophets, and the Writing. You see? The Law, I see five books. The Prophets, look at the Prophets. And then the Writing. These three sections. So the 39 books are divided into these three, these three sections. The law, the prophet, and the writing. You better memorize them. So when the pastor says the law, the prophet's writing, you know what it is. And when you read the Bible, you read the Bible, uh, sometimes they mention the law, the prophet, and the writing. It means this. When, when, when they mention writing, it means this. Prophet means that, you know. So you know what the Bible is talking about. Paul wants to show the Jews that God's ultimate plan is far greater than Israel. So he, he quotes from each section of the Old Testament. Notice that verses 8 and 12. He quotes from each section. He didn't quote all from the law, all from the prophets, all from writing. Actually, he quoted, he quoted one from the law, one from the prophets, and twice from the writing. You go and do your homework, okay? You look at the margin and the small superscript there, A, B, C, yeah? then you look at the margin. It'll tell you where, where the verses are found. So one from the law, one from the prophets, twice from the writing. The law, the prophets, the writing. It is as if Paul is saying God's salvation plan for the Gentiles is revealed in the whole Old Testament. The all the Old Testament. Whole Old Testament. Not just prophet. Not just write, uh, writing. Not just the law. All. Not just in the law, it is in the prophets. Not just in the law and the prophets, it is also in the writing. It's all recorded there. All these verses combined together make a very convincing argument that God has the Gentiles in mind when He planned His rescue mission. We, the Gentiles, are in God's plan. You know, we are in God's plan. We who are called by His name are saved because Jesus has fulfilled His promise to humanity. Whatever God promises, He will fulfill. And this is our hope. If you are lost this morning, if you don't know Jesus, you are lost. If you don't know Jesus, you are lost. Then you have no hope. If you are lost, no matter what happens to you tomorrow, it is a bad thing if you are lost. If you're lost, no matter how good you look, you may be handsome, you're most beautiful girl in town. No matter how rich you are, you are in deep trouble. However, if you are saved, 
If you know Jesus, if you know Jesus, yeah, you are saved. No matter what happens, you have hope. If you are saved, no matter what happens, no matter what happens, no matter what your financial situation is, you have hope. If you are saved, you serve a God who is controlled of everything. Whatever happens in life, He will take care of you if you are saved. Norman, Norman Vincent Peale says this, I have lived a long time now, I have known and observed many people through the years, and I maintain that the nearer a person comes to the Saviour, the more hope he or she has. You just cannot live with Jesus Christ and be defeated or depressed. You cannot live with Him and say, tomorrow is not going to be any good, because Jesus is the Lord of the tomorrows. Remember, you do not go into the new year alone. For our case, Chinese New Year. You remember, you do not go into the Chinese New Year alone. But with the loving God who has walked with you ever since you were a child. So light the flame of hope and watch the shadows vanish. Paul prays that God will fill us with joy, peace, and hope. God is not so concerned with what we eat or drink or other disputable matters. He's more concerned that you have joy, that you have peace, and that you have hope. And God is the one who can fill us with all this. When we put our trust in Jesus and begin to live a life that pleases God and others, we will definitely experience more and more of this joy, this peace, and this hope. I want you all to read now, verse 13 together. Read together. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to say, this is a prayer, as a prayer for the one sitting beside you. Let's take time to pray. It's the same thing as a prayer. Say I give you some time. Yeah. Just say it. Just read to it. Say it to you. Take time. Okay, I'll say this for all of you. As, a, as my closing prayer, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have fast and prayer on 21st August, Thursday. 13 of us came to pray. We spent time confessing our sins, dedicating ourselves to the Lord, and telling Him that we want to have more of Him in our lives. During a prayer session, a member saw a vision of Peter walking on the sea. That's indication that someone is facing challenges and need to have faith in God. We must walk by faith and not by sight. Today, 28 August, is the last day of submission of nomination forms for deacon selection, which will be held in the Santa service on 18 September. According to BN Constitution, all local congregations must elect members to serve their elders or deacons every three years. I will now lead us to say the closing prayer. Let's pray. Lord, may your gracious and invisible hands rest upon us to guide and protect us and to open door for us. Help us to be your faithful, bold and effective witnesses. Bless the work of our hands, be they business, career or studies. Help us to know you better and to obey your will for us. Teach us your word and fill us with the Holy Spirit. Let rivers of living water 
flow out of our lives so that we can be blessing to people who come into contact with us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.